Food Heals Podcast, episode 291. And so what I started to do was create free meal plans on plantbasedonabudget.com that showed people how to eat on a tight budget of $25 per week of fully plant-based Monday through Sunday, breakfast, lunch, and dinner meals. It's not like you kind of focus on one spice when you're cooking Indian food, right? It's, it's really about the flavor of Indian food and the balance of flavors and ingredients is where the artistry is in Indian cooking. Cooking for yourself is one major, major thing that's just going to slash your expenses immediately. Uh, It's always way more affordable to cook for yourself at home. It's more affordable than Postmates? (laughs) Yeah, just just a little bit. Just a little bit, okay. Just a little bit. What you spend on one Postmates, I could probably feed you for an entire week. (laughs) Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Hills Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put down the Ben and Jerry's, get off the couch, and take a walk outside. If you experience any of these symptoms, tell your Facebook friends immediately. All right, welcome, Food Hills Nation. Thanks for joining me. I'm Allison Melody. And three of the myths that we often hear about going plant-based is that it's time-consuming, expensive, and difficult. So today we have three plant-powered pioneers in the plant-based space who are busting every single one of those myths and teaching us how easy, affordable, and fun it is to eat a vegan diet. First up is Tony Akamoto, author of Plant Based on a Budget, delicious vegan recipes for under $30 a week, who is here to share her tips and knowledge. Then we're talking to Maya Kaimel. She is the founder and chief creative officer of Maya Kaimel Foods and winner of the Julia Child Award for her cookbook, Curried Favors, Family Recipes from South India. And from her, we're going to learn more about how to eat and cook plant-based Indian cuisine. And finally, I sit down with Food Heal's favorite, Leslie Durso, who is currently the vegan chef at the Four Seasons Punta Mita and the Four Seasons Santa Barbara to hear her plant-powered tips and advice for making vegan easy and not compromising style for sustainability. But first, it's almost the end of the first month of 2020. So did you stick to those New Year's resolutions? I know it can be hard sometimes, but if your goal is to get healthier and stay healthier and maintain that health in 2020, then definitely you've got to get the healthy food on your plate and you've got to make it easy. And that's why I love Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest really does make it easy and convenient to eat well. They deliver healthy, vegan, chef-crafted food right to your door. I've had their smoothies, soups, harvest bowls. They have fresh veggies, oatmeal bowls, chia bowls, delicious divine smoothies, and oh my god, the lattes. (laughs) And the great thing is, is that you just put everything in your freezer, and when you're ready, pop it out, and everything can be prepared in five minutes or less. So it's in perfect alignment with today's topic of eating healthy, organic, and vegan on a budget and and quickly. (laughs) It's so easy to make for the smoothies. You know, all I had to do was add my own oat milk and then put it in the blender. And oh my God, the mint and cacao smoothie was to die for. Anyways, mix it up in the blender and I've got a smoothie in literally less than five minutes. The lattes too are so yum, so easy to make. The harvest bowls just take a couple of minutes on the stove and you've got this delicious flavorful dish right in front of you ready to go. I love the sweet potato and wild rice hash. The broccoli with vegan cheese was divine. (laughs) And the lime pad thai is my new go-to. Daily Harvest is something that you could enjoy year-round as a quick solution to get all the fruits and veggies that you need throughout your day on your plate every single day. And Daily Harvest is a company that you want to work with, that you want to give your dollars to because they work directly with farmers to harvest organic fruits and vegetables at their peak. And then they freeze them within 24 hours, which is very important for locking in the nutrients. And they've got more than 65 options like 
So many things to choose from. You will not go hungry with Daily Harvest. So if you're sold and you want to check it out, I definitely recommend it. Go to dailyharvest.com, enter the promo code FOODHEALS. You're going to get $25 off your first box. $25 off. I mean, that's such a good deal. That's like a bunch of free Daily Harvest meals right there. So dailyharvest.com, promo code FOODHEALS. All right, next up, my interview with Tony. The Food Hills Podcast starts now. Plant Based on a Budget has been featured in NBC, Fox, U.S. News, and World Report, and so much more. She's a burrito enthusiast and spends her free time swing dancing across the country. Please welcome today's guest, Tony Okamoto. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad to have you. I've been a fan of your work forever. I send people to your website because it really teaches us all how to be healthier, happier, and do it on a budget, eat plant-based. So what was the inspiration behind starting Plant-Based on a Budget? Well, I've been an activist for animals for quite some time, and something that I had heard over and over and over again when promoting veganism to people was that it was just too expensive, and I even heard it time and time again in my own family. They were suffering from diet-related health issues. And every time I said, well, I'm thriving on a vegan diet, how about you at least try Meatless Monday or plant-based once a week? Uh, The big giant concern was eating would be too expensive. Eating vegan would be too expensive. And so I started compiling my family's recipes on plant-based on a budget with some friends. They posted their family's recipes and That's how it all got started. Absolutely. And, you know, the truth is is that I understand their concerns because, yeah, it can be more expensive, but it doesn't have to be. And that's the difference. And so resources like yours are really where people can go to figure out how to do this affordably because, you know, yes, if you went to Whole Foods, there's a reason why they call it Whole Paycheck. But you can even go there and purchase things affordably. And I love like compiling recipes and making food in bulk so that that can be an affordable way to feed your family. So take us through some of the tips so that we can save time and money in the kitchen. Uh, Yes, I recommend starting with a meal plan. Check out your pantry, see what you already have. And so what I like to do is Again, open my refrigerator, do a quick assessment. What do I have and what can I use? What's about to expire? Because I don't want to go to the grocery store and have to buy 100% new groceries. And then from there, I'll sometimes either do a quick Google search based on the ingredients that I have, like an eggplant. I have an eggplant. What can I do with an eggplant that's new and exciting and not going to take me forever? And I'll take my eggplant, see what I can throw in with it, and then go to the grocery store with my grocery shopping list and buy only what is needed to make the meals that I need for the week. And when I choose my grocery store, I usually go with one that's a little bit further from my house. So I recommend exploring different options. The one closest to my house is a co-op and it's pretty expensive. But if I go maybe an extra 10 minutes, it's dramatically cheaper at this like warehouse style grocery store and they have tons of bulk bins like aisles of bulk bins and that's where I do my grocery shopping and so explore what you've got in your neighborhood in my neighborhood there are some international grocery stores there are small mom and pop shops there's a co-op and there's this big giant warehouse style grocery store so there's something for everyone uh, and you have to just decide which is best for you and your family some of my favorite ways to save money. It's by mostly meal planning and shopping with intention. And can you take us back? And I know your journey going plant-based started as early as 15. Can you take us through what happened and got you on the plant power journey that you're on today? Sure. Yeah. So I started very, very, very slowly, not even realizing that I would be here plant-based today. Uh, yeah. I actually had some negative feelings about veganism and plant-based living. And I just thought, oh, that's not for me, that no one in my family is vegan. I don't really know a lot of vegans. It's a hippy dippy lifestyle that I don't want to associate with. And so I had some <laughs> negative feelings in the very beginning, but I originally heard about eating healthier and eliminating red meat through a high school track coach. 
he helped me understand that what I put in my body would affect how I perform. And that's not something that I had considered before. And right across the street from my high school, there was fast food and I would eat the fast food. And and don't get me wrong, I still eat fast food occasionally, but I now understand that it's not the best food for optimal health and it will affect how I perform as an athlete. And so I eliminated the frequent Taco Bell trips. And I also (laughs) eliminated the red meat from my diet. And from there, I just kept going slowly and slowly and slowly until I became a vegetarian when I graduated high school and moved out of my parents' house. And then I became a, a vegan when I found a veg club on my college campus. They We're just so great having a support system, having a community to walk you through it and who are in a similar position in life as you is super helpful. Having friends who are in their early 20s, also budget conscious. Some of them were also deeply rooted in their cultural foods like I was. Having that support system really helped me make the lifestyle change. Absolutely. And what results were you seeing when you change your diet in track and in your life? It's funny because at that time I began to perform better and not get sick to my stomach uh, after I was Mm. running these intense workouts. And then later on, I became kind of a junk food vegan again. And I started training. So this is, let's see, now maybe 10 years later, a little less than maybe eight years after I had already become vegan, I started marathon training. And I had to go back to that time where what I wanted was to be healthy. And so I started eating more whole foods. And remembering that what I put in my body is how I'm going to feel. It's so true. And, you know, going back to what you said, your high school being across the street from fast food, my college, same thing. I remember that we were across the street from a Taco Bell. And then like right next to us was a Hardee's, which is the same as, you know, Carl's Jr. in California. And so any way that you turned out of the college, you were faced immediately with fast food. And so it just was a part of the lifestyle that at the time, you know, back then I wasn't conscious at all. Um, It was just the norm. Broke college kids go eat fast food. And if you're not being told because you're playing a sport or because you have a, you know, a health issue or an injury, you know, maybe foods could help you heal or feel better or play better, then a lot of times this is why we're gaining that freshman 15 or, you know, all that kind of stuff they say about college. And I cer- it certainly happened to me and I can't pinpoint that it was the fast food or it wasn't, but, you know, we are so young and we are not being exposed to these things at an early age. So I'm really happy that your book and your website does all of that and helps people see that there's another, a better way to do this. And it can be affordable because obviously we know fast food is affordable. That's why people go there. Besides the fact that it's addictive. (laughs) It's, It's interesting that you say that because it's actually a lot more expensive than cooking your food at home. And I work with a woman named Michelle Kane. She runs the website called World of Vegan. And we did a project together last spring. It was like a small filmmaking project. She does videography on YouTube and we wanted to... Yes, I love Michelle, by the way. Oh, isn't she great? (laughs) I love everything about her content. She's so welcoming and positive and... Super authentic. Yep. And so we did... We worked on a project together where we found someone on Craigslist and he lived about an hour away in a rural community And we asked him, if we pay for your grocery stores and help you learn to cook, can you eat plant-based for seven days and let us document your journey? And he told us about his lifestyle. He said he had really never cooked. He eats fast food minimum of 12 times per week. And he was just so wonderful and stuck in a rut. He didn't know Mm -hmm. how to move forward and we got to document the whole process and we did his blood work on day one and on day seven. And in that time, we monitored how much money he was saving versus with our meal plan that we had offered him versus how much he had been spending on the 12 meals he was eating for fast food. And it was, I think, a $5,000 a year difference if he ate plant-based the way we were teaching him, he would be saving $5,000 a year on food. And saving all the money on his future health care costs. Way to go, girl. That's amazing. Exactly. <laughs> and in that seven days, he lowered his cholesterol. 
He low, he got himself out of the pre-diabetic zone. He lost eight pounds, and he said he felt generally happier and healthier. And we were so proud of him. He even got his mom to do it with him. And it's incredible how quickly the body can heal. I mean, seven days sounds like a miracle, but that's how quickly the body is like, yeah, let's get back into balance. This is what we do. Yep. We actually had Dr. Michael Greger in Mm -hmm. the film with us talking to Raul about his journey. And he was talking about how that kind of change happens with months of medications for some people without a lifestyle change. They have to still do months of medications. And he was able to reverse his poor health or begin the reversal of his poor health in just seven days with a lifestyle change. Amazing. And where can people watch this transformation? Oh, thank you. It's at sevendaysdoc.com. Sevendaysdoc.com. Okay, go check it out, Food Heals Nation. I love stories like this because it is so true that yes, healing can take time and it has taken us time to destroy our bodies and create disease in the body, but you will be pleasantly surprised in most cases how quickly the body can bounce back. So that's a great point. It's so cool that you guys did that. And so let's go back into, you know, you said it actually costs less to eat plant-based if you do it the right way than it does to eat fast food. And I, and I guess I should have said that it is a misconception that fast food is cheap, but it seems cheap when you don't know how to cook, when you don't know how to purchase in bulk, when you see the prices at Whole Foods or something like that, if you're like, I want to eat healthy, but I can't because it's too expensive. So take us through some of those really money saving tips that everyone can do right now. Like, would it be like, buy all your quinoa in bulk, and then then you always have a recipe? Like, what are some of your number one tips? When I started plant based on a budget, I would regularly tell people that eating plant based was affordable, and I would have tons of recipes. But When it came down to it, people didn't have the familiarity with cooking and grocery shopping and didn't know how to put the recipes together to make a meal plan. And so it wasn't enough to just offer recipes. And so what I started to do was create free meal plans on plantbasedonabudget.com that showed people how to eat on a tight budget of $25 per week a fully plant-based Monday through Sunday breakfast, lunch, and dinner meals. Oh my, I'm blown away right now. 25, I thought you were going to say $25 a day. (laughs) No, no, no. That's $1.20 per meal. And it was really hard. And I understand why some people who don't have a lot of food money feel stressed because I sat at the grocery store for hours doing the work so that other people don't have to do the work and figuring out what are the cheapest ways to save money. And I went to a place that had bulk bins because buying only what you need saves a lot of money. You don't have to go buy a full bag when you only need one cup of brown rice to last you for a couple days. Uh, So what I did was I cooked all of my stuff on my day off. And for people who want to save Money, I recommend thinking about your time too. Time is the most valuable asset that I feel we have and we can be spending time working or spending time with family or whatever it is that makes you happy. And so I definitely consider that. I had everyone doing their cooking on their day off and cooking four entrees to last you the whole week. And so you are eating leftovers four times, four meals, three times each. And then I did overnight oats for breakfast or something like a granola. Those are really easy. Breakfast cereals, all of those things are easy and inexpensive. At the bulk bins where I shopped, I could buy bulk cereal. So cornflakes or or whatever your favorite cereals were. And that also saved a lot of money. So instead of buying the full box, I bought in bulk. And okay, so this sounds a little bit, a little bit interesting. When I go to the grocery store, I bring a calculator, and I bring my measuring cups. And Can I just bring you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would actually love to go grocery shopping with you. Uh, I bring my measuring cups. And when I get there, I cover it in the plastic bag, so that it's hygienic. And I measure out exactly what I need. So if I know I'm cooking two cups of brown rice that week for my meal plan, I only buy the two cups. I don't eyeball it. I only buy what I need. And that helps save a lot of money. 
Another thing that I do is I rely on some frozen produce. You can buy frozen produce at the Dollar Tree store. You can buy frozen produce for under a dollar at places like Walmart. And it helps reduce food waste. So if you're someone who ends up buying a lot of greens and whatever your favorite vegetables are, and then you have the best intentions, but let them go to the wayside, check out frozen produce because that'll definitely save you money in the long run. There are some people who feel like, what about the nutrition? But when you're throwing it away, it doesn't really matter. It's just like throwing dollars away. So I rely on frozen produce in the meal plans. Great. And I feel like I do a lot of frozen produce too. And here's why. I have my farm box delivered. So it's like between 24 to 45 bucks, depending on what I get. It's every two weeks. And it delivers me two boxes of fresh fruits and vegetables in season, organic and local. And it's so much fun. So I always have something fresh, but then sometimes I'm making something and I won't have the fresh ingredient. But guess what? I have it frozen because I already had it in the freezer from last season or because I was at the grocery store buying in bulk. And so then I can make the perfect combination I need of frozen and fresh vegetables. And I think freezing is always good because then you always have an ingredient that may not be in season or you may not, you know, have access to at that moment or want to go out and buy. So I think, you know, combining is fine. Yeah, definitely. I live in an apartment now, but I used to have a garden. And when I had a backyard, I would grow tomatoes and zucchini and can a lot of what I was making. So I would make tomato marinara sauce and can that or just boil my tomatoes and freeze those for the rest of the season so I can make fresh marinara later. Yum. I'm getting hungry. (laughs) Okay. I want to know more about gardening. So tell everyone what they can do, whether they have a yard or just an apartment and you can just grow things on your windowsill. What can we do to garden? Okay. So my mom has never been a gardener. Well, she was like, she was never a gardener. And then she started growing in her windowsill, these little seeds of tomato plants and zucchini plants. So the tomatoes and zucchinis grow really well in Sacramento. You can grow massive amounts. I was so tired of zucchini one year. I did zucchini cupcakes and zucchini bread and zucchini chips, and they do really well in Northern California. And so my mom, who has never, ever done it, grew beautiful gardens just by doing quick Google searches. And she had no experience. She didn't have a lot of time to garden and it worked really well for her. What I did was I went to Home Depot and bought the little plants. So that was too much work for me to to grow them in my windowsill. And I planted them in containers. So I also at Home Depot bought like a little, they're like big flower pots and they were five bucks, so not that much money. And I would say in tomatoes and zucchini, I saved probably a hundred dollars from just one plant of each of them. Wow, that's awesome. Yep. So I recommend even if you don't have a lot of space, you can put it on your porch, you can put it on your balcony, you can do more in your backyard if you want to plant them directly in the ground. It's definitely worth the time investment if you have the time. Okay, Tony, so here are some fun questions for you we have to get to before we wrap up. What does it mean to be a burrito enthusiast? It means that I love burritos. In every city, I want to try the burrito. And let me tell you, being from California is really, really hard to go anywhere and have them be our burritos. Our burritos are the best, but I take my burritos pretty seriously. I like the perfect rice and the perfect beans and always my avocado. I don't, I mean, I'll eat the guacamole, but I prefer fresh avocado on the side and I eat it in a certain way and it's silly, but awesome. I love burritos too. I feel like they're also something like really good you can make at home and I'm sure you have recipes for that, but what is your opinion of Taco Bell with their vegan options? Are are we okay eating that? Is it still bad? Where are we on Taco Bell? You know, I travel a lot and so I am so grateful to have Taco Bell available when I'm traveling and there's nothing else. I was just in DC last week and my plane flew in at around 10 o'clock 
and the closest place within walking distance to my Airbnb was a Taco Bell that was open until 2.30. So I can go in and get a vegan meal for not that much money, still not as cheap as cooking myself, but it was great that I had a food option that I didn't have to cook because my Airbnb didn't have a kitchen for me to use. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, especially when you fly from the East Coast to the West Coast, you often arrive too late to get anything for dinner. So you're literally your only options are fast food or whatever's open late. So it's not usually the healthiest option or the cheapest option. I'm grateful that, you know, fast food is going the way of veganism too. And Del Taco, they just got, what was it, Impossible or Beyond? It was the Beyond meat and it was pretty, it was pretty good. What, have you tried it? I have not. How was it? It was good. I try to try everything just so I know when people ask me. It's not something that I would eat regularly. But again, I'm really glad that it exists for people who will already be going to Del Taco and would prefer or would even try a vegan meat. Yeah. Well, it's like I know some people have told me that now and they're meat eaters and the fact that they now prefer the impossible burger at restaurants over the beef burger or the turkey burger or something like that is showing the progress because they feel better when they eat it, but they still get their taste buds satisfied because it still has, you know, the bun or the cheese or whatever it is that they need, the ketchup, the onions, you know, whatever your thing is. But the burger meat is is impossible or it's beyond and they're, they're feeling better. So it's like I'm so grateful that these options are existing now in restaurants and fast food. Exactly. I took my nephew to Carl's Jr. And I didn't tell him that I was getting him the Beyond Burger and he ate it and he didn't question it or anything. That's how you know it's good. That's how you know it's good when you can give a taste test to a little kid and they don't tell the difference. <laughs> That's such a good point. Absolutely. So it's okay to fool your friends for a good cause. (laughs) Exactly. All right. So tell us about swing dancing. Is that your your passion besides food? Uh, I love swing dancing so much. I started swing dancing eight years ago, and it has become a huge part of my life. It's my friend group. It's how I like to de-stress. It's how I exercise. And I've traveled all over the country for swing dancing. I've even gone swing dancing in France and have met really incredible people. It's a great way to express yourself. The music is really fun. The culture is really fun. And I highly recommend it, especially if you think that you're not a good dancer. People are like, oh, but I can't dance. I have two left feet. Just take some lessons and I highly recommend it to you. So fun. Is that your primary form of exercise while you're plant-based or is there something else that you do in addition to? I have a a gym that is nearby and I go to the classes there. I have an accountability buddy who really I would never go to the gym without. She is such a great inspiration. She's always like, hey, Tony, there's a cycling class or there's aqua aerobics. And it's so cool to be out in aqua aerobics because we both work from home so we can take a long lunch and go to aqua aerobics. And we have all of our retired friends who are in aqua aerobics. It's awesome. Okay. So you have all of this passion for eating plant-based on a budget and helping others, which I really admire. And how did you get to that next step of writing your brand new book, which just came out in May, Plant-Based on a Budget? Yeah. So it's been a long time coming. I started Plant-Based on a Budget seven years ago. And I now have been working on it full time for three years. And that whole three years, I knew I really wanted to write this comprehensive plant based on a budget recipe book that also had lifestyle stuff. So there are other plant based budget friendly recipe books, but they don't talk a lot about how you can apply that to your life. If you don't have a lot of money, they don't provide tips and time information. And that's stuff that I really, really, really wanted to include because I learned how to cook through cookbooks. And so using my experience in learning to cook from cookbooks, I knew that I wanted to have a book that included pictures with every recipe space for notes so that people can scribble how they modified the recipe and also different variations so that in case you've had the recipe a hundred times, you can still spice it up or change it up to make it new and fresh. I went the traditional publishing route and I have been working on the book for two years and I'm so excited that it's finally out. Oh, I'm so happy for you. I know how much work it is and your cover is beautiful. You have a foreword by Michael Greger. I mean, congratulations. This is really awesome. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really proud of it. I don't have any kids. So it feels like I'm birthing this beautiful baby to the world. And <laughs> I'm so proud of it to nurture something from conception and to see it out in the world just makes me so pleased and proud. Oh, I love that. And let me just read her subtitle. So it's plant-based on a budget, but then it's delicious vegan recipes for under $30 a week in less than 30 minutes a meal. I know I need that, Food Heals Nation. If you need that, go get the book. It's on Amazon. Where else can they get the book, Tony? You can get it at Barnes & Noble. I heard that it's going to be in Costco and Whole Foods and a lot of other places, wherever you buy books, really as you should be in all of those places. So podcaster to podcaster, please tell us about your podcast because I think we have a lot in common on the podcast that we do. <laughs> yes, yes. So I run a podcast called the Plant Powered People Podcast with Michelle Kane. I talked about her earlier. She, again, is so amazing. And what we do is we understand that we can't answer all of the questions that are asked of us. And so we bring people who have a common obstacle in plant-based living and have them address how they overcame that obstacle. And so some of the things that we've talked about are, so you become plant-based and you work serving animal products at your restaurant. How do you do it? How do you manage? We know that you can't quit your job just because you become plant-based, but how, how can you deal with it? Or how you can live with your non-plant-based partner, how you can raise kids with your non-plant-based partner. There are so many different obstacles and it can it can still be done. Plant-based living is achievable. I could not agree more. So where can everyone hear the podcast? At plantpoweredpeople.com. All right, Tony. Well, thank you so much for all your tips. This has been so much fun. I have learned a lot and I can't wait to figure out how I can eat for $25 to $30 a week. So we have your book. We have your podcast. Where can everyone stalk you on Instagram, follow you online, all that good stuff? I am most active on Instagram at Plant Based on a Budget. And you can find me everywhere else on Plant Based on a Budget. Perfect. And she has a beautiful feed, Food Heals Nation. Check her out. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you very much. All right, Food Heals Nation, I hope you enjoyed those amazing tips from Tony. Check her out, plantbasedonabudget.com. Next up, Susie and I are talking to Maya all about plant-based Indian cuisine, so stay tuned for that. But first, I want to mention a new female-founded company that I've recently discovered that's really taking a modern approach to feminine care. It's Lola. What is Lola? Lola offers a line of organic tampons and pads and liners, all natural cleansing wipes and essential oils. And the founders, Jordana and Alexandra, started the company with a simple and a really seemingly obvious idea that women shouldn't have to compromise when it comes to feminine care products. They asked themselves, if we care about the ingredients in the food that we eat and the beauty products that we use, why shouldn't the same be true of our feminine care products? This is a message and a mission that I can get behind. As you know, at Food Heals, we are all about making sure that what we put in our bodies is organic, is healthy, is not full of GMOs and toxic materials. And very often, you know, unfortunately, what's in those drugstore tampons and pads is not something that we want absorbing into our body um, for a week, once a month. How toxic is that? It's kind of scary. I grew up being terrified of toxic shock syndrome. Luckily, it never happened, but there's a reason for that. It's because there were toxins in our tampons, people. You know, we don't want that crap in our feminine care products. You know, the FDA doesn't require brands to disclose a comprehensive list of ingredients in their feminine care products. So <laughs> most of them don't. And that's why I love Lola, because they offer complete transparency about the ingredients that are found in their tampons, their pads, their liners, and their wipes. Many major brands are using gross synthetic ingredients in their products like rayon and polyester. Their feminine care products might be treated with harsh chemical cleansing agents, fragrances, dyes, all the things that we don't want in our products that we're going to consume or put anywhere near our body. You know, our skin is our largest organ of absorption, of detox, and so we don't want to be exposing it to these toxic chemicals. Lola products are 100% organic and they have no chemicals, fragrances, synthetics, or 
dies. And it's a company that gives back so you can do good with your purchase. For every purchase, Lola donates feminine care products to homeless shelters across the U.S. So check it out. I personally love the convenience. I'm a huge fan. I tried their essential oils on my stomach the other day when I was having, you know, pretty bad cramps and it wasn't a day where I could stay home all day. I actually had a VIP day with my client, which means I had to be on. I had to be very focused for eight hours to sit with her and help her build her business. And instead of being miserable, I was all right because I just kept rubbing that essential oil um, on my belly in order to get rid of the pain and it really really helped Um, and they do have a subscription so it's super convenient it'll come straight to your door you don't even have to ever go to the drugstore or send your significant other out for pads or tampons or anything like that again so Lola is generously offering 30% off your first month subscription at mylola.com just enter the promo code foodheals and you'll get that 30% off All right, next up, my interview with Maya. You are listening to the Food Hills Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. Her goal was to use quality ingredients and home-cooked methods to make it easy for consumers to experience delicious regional Indian flavors at home, and her products are now available in over 7,000 stores nationwide. Please welcome today's guest, Maya Kaimal. Hey. Hey, Maya. How are you? I'm great. It's nice to be with you guys. Thanks for being here. So take us back and tell us about how you started with this brand. What was the story behind it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I. it's funny. I, I was kind of a reluctant entrepreneur. I really didn't think I was going into business or a food business. That was not uh, how I kind of set out in my career. I started out, I was an art major. I started working in the magazine business. I was a photo editor. So I had a whole kind of visual life going on. Mm -hmm. But I am half Indian. My mother's American. My father's from South India. So uh, I grew up with a lot of Indian flavors in my life. My, My dad used to cook a lot. We would go to India, visit family. So you know, these, these flavors were with me and they were really, uh, and the recipes that my dad would write down very carefully, they were the recipes that I took with to New York when I moved there and, and what I cooked as my comfort food. So I really, um, you know, that part of my heritage was, was always really important. And when I would cook that food for people, for friends, they always had such a Re- strong response, like, wow, this is not what I thought Indian food was. So it became clear to me that there was this kind of gap between what people's idea of Indian food was and what it, you know, what they experienced if you, they had a home cooked meal. So I just kept wanting to like figure out how I could get people to to know more about like, you know, home cooked Indian food and also South Indian food. Cause my father's from the South where it's really tropical. So there's a lot of coconut in the food, a lot of like, you know, fresh chilies and fresh herbs. So it's kind of different from what you get in restaurants. So I'm already getting hungry. <laughs> um, it, well, you know, it is really, there's yeah, Indian food can be amazing, but, um, So finding a way to to kind of communicate that was important to me. And it started for me as um, writing cookbooks. So I wrote two cookbooks and um, the first one was called Curried Favors. And uh, it got a nice award when it came out is Julia Child Award, which is one they give out for best first cookbook. And she actually gave it to me, the award herself. She was still alive. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> it was really like a thing because my mom totally loved Julia Child. I mean, she would watch her on TV and she was cooking out of her cookbooks like all the time. And she just idolized her. And so to, to get that reward was really like amazing. So, um, so that, that sort of gave me like a little footing in the food world, but I was still doing my magazine life. Um, and that, and, uh, and then eventually things in the magazine world, you know, started to change. And I actually got laid off from my job the day I got back from my honeymoon. Oh my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, my husband and I had like gone shopping for for uh, you know condos in Brooklyn for like a day, and then I got laid off and was totally at a loss for what I was going to do. That's when kind of the the ideas started to open up. A friend was really encouraging us uh, who has a uh, chain of grocery stores in the city. And he's like, look, there's not a lot of exciting Indian food. This is 2003, by the way. Mm-hmm. This is a while back. So he he's like, I really think there's room to do something different and exciting in Indian in the Indian space because I don't see anybody doing it. So you should. So so that was kind of the, that was how I got like kickstarted into doing this in the first place. And I have a question. Did you have fear from going from, you know, oh what you're doing to jumping into writing a cookbook? I like explain that process to us because I can imagine what I would be like <laughs> and, oh, have, my God. and have been, not with cookbooks, but my own business. Jumping into the business part was terrifying. Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, I, I was so used to having a day job, right? I just didn't like, you know, my husband, he's a journalist, so he was comfortable with the like some uncertainty in life but I was like I need a job I need to know who 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 am I reporting to what am I doing today how do I how do I measure what you know what I'm accomplishing and it, it was very unsteadying plus I had no idea about business I mean my dad was a physicist my mom was an editor there's nobody has a business in my family so I was really like in virgin territory but um but again, we, we kind of turned to this circle of friends we had in the city who were pretty entrepreneurial, um, one that I'd mentioned that had the, the, the stores, and they kind of helped open up their network a bit, lawyers and accountants and that, like sort of getting the right people around me um, helped. And my husband was super supportive, right? He had gone to law school, so he could kind of review contracts and things. So, so I just had to sort of surround myself by people who did know what they were doing and and just figure it out. And you and your husband launched your line from your apartment. Tell us about that. So we were living in a you know, little Brooklyn apartment. Now it's like a cliche, you know, starting a food business in Brooklyn. Back then it was like, if, you know, nobody was doing it. We were just, we had just had, um, oh, that was the other thing. Yeah. So we got married, sort of started to figure out the business. Then I got pregnant with twins and we launched the company and had twins within the same like four months. Oh my God. Fortunately, it was a biggish apartment at the time. We we had like a floor of this um, nice house. And so we had some, we had a little, little tiny office for me, little tiny room for the twins, office for Guy. So we, we had some space, but it was just, it was just clear that New York City was going to stress us out too much. And so within a year, we, we moved to upstate New York, where we could really like de-stress, get some family help with the kids and try to survive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to pause and ask you guys both a question because both of you have businesses with your spouses. Tell me how it is working with your significant other. Maya, you go first. Oh my God. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to throw a curveball, but I really want to know. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. Oh I mean, wow. Yeah. It's, you know, it's definitely been a, uh, been a plus and, you know, and a challenge. I mean, he, he's like the most supportive person and totally believes in me. You know, he's been crucial to, I, I'd say the best thing about my husband is like, he has this great bullshit meter. So he, sorry, can I say that? I don't know. Yes, <laughs> you can totally curse. Ali, I forgot to cover that. Um, he has a really good like he can detect when someone is just you know like full of it so we've been able to avoid some big mistakes because you know i'm i'm a little more like 
you know, the optimist, like, oh, I think they, you know, I think they're going to really help us. And so I, I have definitely benefited from his like more critical eye on things. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely like, there's no break, right? There's no kind of, you know, it's hard to sort of stop thinking and talking about the business. That's a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> I would, I would definitely agree. It's really hard because you go from business partners during the day to at sometimes spouse to lover to, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's really hard to juggle in retrospect. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, Oh, why did we do this? But I also know why we did it because we also complement each other. It sounds like you and your husband do too, Maya, where he mm-hmm. has skills that I don't have. And I have skills that he doesn't have. So together, like yeah. he's the super nice one. He's from Canada. I'm a New Yorker by birth. I'm a bitch. Sorry, but I am. <laughs> and I just like your husband, I have a bullshit meter and I have no problem calling people out and I have no problem negotiating. And he's kind of like, oh, you know, let's be nice. And I'm like, nah, fuck that. So, <laughs> so my husband's Canadian too, but he's the, he's the tough one. <laughs> that's so weird. Where is he from? Toronto? <laughs> he's from Toronto. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Our our theme of our wedding, at least for on our brochures, um, we called it New Yanada, like New York and Canada. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but yeah, it w- it's 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 definitely challenging and it's created a lot of fights sometimes. But then, like I said, at the same time, I couldn't do it with anybody else. And I also really appreciate the skills that he does have that I don't like. Like he's a great salesperson and I've become better by watching him. So I could I could never do all of the Like together, we're doing a lot more than we could on our own. Yeah, definitely. I, I get you on the like complementary skill set thing. And, you know, I mean, God, the trust is there, right? So that really helps because there's a lot at risk in business. I mean, boy. Well, you guys are amazing. And I applaud you because <laughs> I don't think I could do it. <laughs> we're, we're both still married so far. So that's <laughs> so, so far. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Maya, one thing that I love or many things that I love about your line of products is that they are vegan and that they're full of healing spices. So can you tell us a little bit about like the staple spices in Indian cooking and what their healing benefits really are? Yeah, sure. It all ties back to Ayurveda, which is the science of medicine that's 5,000 years old. It's like the you know, oldest system of medicine in the world. And I know you've had some experts on um, before. And yeah, it's like a whole field of study. And I do not pretend to be an, an authority on Ayurveda. It, but I just appreciate how Indians have figured out the way that these ingredients are not only delicious, but have all these great properties that keep you healthy. Because there are so many components, right? So many different spices going into any you know, given Indian dish, you're really like the benefits are just, you know, exponential. So a lot of the spices, you know, cumin, coriander, ginger, they help digestion, you know, helping to break down beans. Um, so they're easier to process. And ginger alleviates nausea. I mean, that's known to a lot of cultures. Chilies, for example, really also help improve your circulation. Cardamom helps remove toxins. And then there's like the, you know, the superstar turmeric, of course, which is like antibacterial, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, good for your skin, good for your liver, helps prevent Alzheimer's disease too, as an added bonus. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's not like you kind of focus on one spice when you're cooking Indian food, right? It's it's really about the flavor of Indian food and the balance of flavors and ingredients is where the artistry is in Indian cooking. And what about curry? It, it's kind of become like an an easy handle to uh, refer to Indian food. Oh, Indian food, right? That's curry, and then it it's immediately polarizing. Like I love curry, I hate curry, I'm allergic to curry. That's my favorite. <laughs> like, how are you allergic to curry? Right, so curry, you know, it's it's you know it's an English kind of word taken from a an Indian word that meant sauce that was pronounced kadi, and then the British just applied it to every single dish in India where Indians 
had a different name for every single dish. So it, the whole concept that you would name, you know, refer to everything by one name is completely foreign. So the British kind of tacked that on to Indian Indian food, and then the 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 blend, the spices that went into making that, you know, they wanted to be able to bring back to England with them, right, and have their cooks at home make curry for them. So that was the sort of genesis of curry powder because Indians don't pre-mix their spices. They make a unique blend for each dish that they're cooking. But it was a convenient form of taking those flavors, you know, back home for the British during the British Empire in India. So curry powder, we think of as sort of this yellow mixture because it contains turmeric. But, you know, if you cooked with curry powder, then everything would taste the same. And so no Indian would ever use that. So curry is a non-specific word. It's just a kind of um, like a watered down term for thinking about Indian food or thinking about d- Indian dishes that have a ground have ground spices in them, take on that color that the turmeric gives them, that kind of golden color, and often is saucy. Right. But beyond that, it really doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like saying stew. You know, it just doesn't it doesn't tell you much. It just kind of it kind of signals that it's Indian. But that's not even clear cut because you have Thai curry. You've got red, yellow, green curries from Thailand. There's Vietnamese curry, Chinese curry, Japanese curry. I mean, it's just that those spices were grown in that part of the world. And so everybody found their own way of working with them and their own, I know, applied their own ideas to this concept of curry. Got it. Well, thank you for clearing that up. So if there was a vegan dish that you make or from your book or anything like that, where's a good place for our listeners to start with like a really good Indian dish with lots of like healing, delicious spices? Mm, Yeah. I mean, for me, hands down, that would be uh, a chickpea curry called chole. Also, people know chana masala, right? But it's just like a very satisfying chickpea and tomato and onion curry that also it contains like mustard seeds and cumin seeds. You, you know, you start out kind of sizzling those in oil and then fry up your onion and then fry up your tomato till it's nice and soft and add your you know, coriander and cumin and turmeric, cayenne and black pepper, that would be the spice spice mix I would add. Um, And then adding your chickpeas and simmering the whole thing till they're they're nice and soft. And I like to mash them up a little bit to, to break it down. Yeah. And then just like finishing with a little lemon, a little fresh cilantro. And it's, that's just one of my favorites. Would you say that all Indian food is very, very stewed, like very cooked over a long period of time. That was what um, my impression was whenever I visited Indian restaurants in the States. But I don't know if that's representative of all the cuisine. I was just wondering, because I feel like a lot of Indian food is slow cooked with all the spices. Well, yeah, I'm. it's a good question. If if your exposure to Indian food is through Indian restaurants, then yes, that is your impression of Indian food. However, if you were to, to go there and get invited into homes, you would experience Indian food as a much kind of, much lighter, kind of brighter tasting, um, fresher experience. Because in restaurants, often, you know, they're taking shortcuts, there's pre-made pastes. It doesn't reflect the way that home cooks are like prepping everything, like just for that meal. Like there's the, it's harder running a restaurant, you're offering a lot of dishes, you, a lot of stuff is pre-made. But at homes, in homes, you often get these really nice stir fries, like in Kerala, where my father's from on the very southern tip, they do this dish called thorin. And it's made with chopped up like green beans that are uh, stir fried with a uh, mustard seed and grated coconut and a little cumin and turmeric and, and then these fresh curry leaves that are super fragrant. And that is like the most beautiful, light, su- crunchy side dish. And there are lots of dishes like that. And there's lots of light salads and sort of yogurt, um, yeah, yogurt based salads um, with fresh vegetables in them. Really, you eat, you know, you eat Indian food made by Indians and you don't get that heavy feeling in your stomach. You know, you feel cleaner. 
So your parents were both cooks. How did that shape the forming of this company and the ingredients that you use and all that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, it was um, a big, big part of it. I mean, food was always a big conversation at home. My mom was a great cook and she was a stay-at-home mom. So she was cooking and really into it like every night. My dad would, would you know, he, he was an atmospheric physicist and he really missed the flavors of home. So he would tinker, like do it all very methodically though, because he was had this scientific mind. So he his approach to figuring out Indian food, you know, recreate dishes that he wanted to eat. He was very analytical about it. He was like, okay, you know, these are the spices my mother used to use. So, you know, here's a good, this is what South Indian food is spiced like. And then my North Indian friends cook this way. And so, and they're using the, you know, more cumin, less coriander. Like he kind of came up with a philosophy of like how spices are used in the different regions. So that was hugely helpful to me when I started to dive in because it was sort of laid out. Otherwise you encounter Indian recipes and it's like this massively long list of spices and ingredients and you just kind of, you don't know how they relate to each other. So getting a handle on that ha- has been like a, a massive leg up for me as I try to create different flavor profiles from different parts of India. And what's the sexiest spice? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, saffron is definitely a bit of an aphrodisiac, you know, like drinks made out of saffron and milk are supposed to, you know, help your sex drive. So I guess it would have to be saffron. Oh, I could see that. (laughs) Maya, so where would you suggest um, people that, you know, because there's certain areas of the country where you can find Indian or, you know, East Asian grocery stores easily for ingredients, but where should people shop? Where are, are, you know, are the ingredients in your cookbook easily accessible? They are. Uh, when I wrote the the books, I was trying to include things that were available in grocery stores. The trends have grown even stronger since then. And so you can definitely find all the seasonings. Um, you know, there's like one or two things that you might have to either, you know, order online or if you have an Indian grocery store or, um, you know, a South Asian grocery store, those that they, they will have things like, um, well, fresh curry leaves. Those those can be a little tricky to find, but if you can find them, they are amazing and they really add a whole aromatic quality, kind of like a cross between Mm, grapefruit and bell pepper, like wonderful fragrance. But, you know, tamarind, asafoetida is one of those funky spices that you don't use much of it, but it it's sort of transformative when you put a pinch in some hot oil and it like smells like scallions and it's really good. So yeah, I mean, for the most part, you can make a great Indian meal from what you can buy at your grocery store. And if you want to go deeper, you, you can easily get these things online. And then you have your line, which is at 7,000 stores. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we uh, we do. So we've got simmer sauces, which give you like a really easy shortcut to making a curry. But because we take time and build the flavors very carefully and slowly when we produce them, just like a home cook would, they have a nice full layered flavor. It tastes like you spent a long time making it, but you don't. <laughs> I mean, but... Um, you know, and then we have these dolls. So, um, you know, dolls being the Indian seasoned lentil dishes. The and AHL, have, not dolls that you play with. Right, not <laughs> Indian, but yeah, baby doll, right? It's my <laughs> D-A-L. So we have five different flavors of those representing, you know, some of the vast variety of, of the way Indians make those dishes because there's a, like a million different dolls in India. Um, we're about to launch some rice. Uh, really yummy style of rice uh, from South India called Sareka rice. It's got the nutritional profile of brown rice, but it's, it's, but it is a white rice. So, um, but it's really, it's yummy. So let's talk about rice for a second. And I don't think I'd, I've ever said that in my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I've, you know, whenever I've tried to cook rice at home, I invariably, invariably mess it up. And I noticed that when I have gone to Indian, specifically Indian and Persian restaurants, the rice is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are they doing to rice in Indian cuisine? Go ahead. I feel like you already know. What is the secret? 
Yeah. It's a good comment you make because it's for something that seems so simple, it's there's actually like real nuance to it. Like you've got to get the right proportions and the right heat and the right time and the right pot. And if one of those things is off, it can completely throw off your rice. Indians are using a, an aged, like, um, special grain basmati, right? That's the most popular. And the aging, um, it deepens the flavor and makes it quite um, aromatic, but it doesn't take a lot of water. So it's like for one cup of rice, you only use one and a half cups of water, whereas like a lot of people think it's one to two, which it is for different. So it's less water than you think. Just cooking it for 20 minutes and then shut the heat off and let it just sit undisturbed. And that's the other thing. You cannot stir rice. You have to be patient. Leave the lid on. Don't peek. Don't stir. Oh, <laughs> Leave I, it all I peek and stir all the time. <laughs> well, so what happens then is that you release some of the steam and moisture and it kind of throws off the the calibration of like just how much time and how much moisture goes into the grains. I think I just need to get a rice cooker and call it a day. Well, that would solve your problem. Yes, definitely. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much the answer because rice cookers are, they just work every time. Like you can't go wrong. That's true. And and as long as you've got your water proportion right, you know, and, and, and every package will tell you what you should be using for that kind of rice, then, then you should be all set. All right, Maya. Well, you have a beautiful Instagram. You've got your blog. You've got your product lines. Tell everyone where they can find you online, find your books, get your products in stores, all that good stuff. Oh, sure. Yeah. So our website is my name, mayakaimal.com, which is M-A-Y-A-K-A-I-M-A-L.com. And we are sold in Whole Foods. Um, We're also available in Costco. We're in many um, of your large supermarkets around the country. And also we're in pretty much every natural food store around the country too. Well, thank you so much for being here, Maya. We really appreciate it. No, it was fun. My pleasure. Thank you, Maya. All right, Food Heals Nation, I hope you enjoyed our interview with Maya. You can find out where to get her delicious plant-based fare by going to mayakaimal.com and clicking on the store locator. And Food Heals Nation, Valentine's Day is just about two weeks away, so basically it'll be here before we know it. Are you ready? Whether you are shopping for your significant other or thinking of gifts to suggest he or she get you, or maybe you're celebrating yourself and the single life this Valentine's Day, Venus at Fleur has got you covered. Do you like how I said it? Venus at Fleur (laughs) has got you covered with their customizable arrangements of real roses that last a year. That's right. Not only are these eternity roses absolutely stunning and beautiful and smell divine, but they're also infused with essential oils that keep them staying fresh for up to a year. And I can attest to the fact that mine are still alive and well and smelling fresh. I've had them for probably two weeks now, and they really, really do freshen up my space. I personally got two arrangements um, in red, of course, because that's my jam. One set of roses is in my living room and the other I put in my guest house. So you probably don't know this, but I recently started renting out my guest house on Airbnb and the scent really does keep it smelling fresh. You know, one of my tenants even commented on how beautiful they were. And you can check them out on Instagram or the website to see some gorgeous designs. Fans of Eternity arrangements include Gigi Hadid, Cardi B, and the Kardashians. So get your real roses that last a year by visiting venusetflair.com, V-E-N-U-S-E-T-F-L-E-U-R.com slash foodheels. Enter the promo code FOODHEALS for complimentary shipping. It is truly a unique gift that I can't recommend enough for that special someone in your life or even a family member who maybe is, you know, having a hard time this year. You know, flowers aren't just for Valentine's Day. They can be used to brighten a loved one's day any time of the year, and they even make a great housewarming present or just a gift to gift to yourself. Venusaflor.com slash foodheals, V-E-N-U-S-E-T-F-L-E-U-R dot com slash food heals. Next up, my interview with Leslie. 
She is the glowing face of a fresher plant-based movement that refuses to compromise style for sustainability. And she's the vegan chef at the Four Seasons Punta Mita. You know her from multiple episodes of Food Heals. Please welcome today's guest, Leslie Durso. Hi, everybody. Hi, Allie. Hi, girl. How's it going? <laughs> so good. I'm so happy to be here. It's always good to have you in the studio with Pepe, mm-hmm. the Food Heals puppy for today. <laughs> He just, loves it here. Are you kidding? He's so happy. I know. He's just sitting in her lap like the cutest dog ever. Aww. Aww you guys are so <laughs> cute. All right. Well, today we're talking about how to go plant-based on a budget. And this is something I'm really bad at. So I'm hoping you can help. Yeah, of course. Because I go plant-based, but I just go to Whole Foods and I pay too much money. So like, how can I stop? Well, <laughs> cooking for yourself is one major, major thing that's just going to slash your expenses immediately. Uh, It's always way more affordable to cook for yourself at home. It's more affordable than Postmates? (laughs) Yeah, just just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. What you spend on one Postmates, I could probably feed you for an entire week. I believe you, and I need you to teach me. (laughs) (laughs) That that can be arranged. Can I just come over and you cook for me for a week? I just won't leave. Well, I invite you over all the time. We just live on opposite ends of town. I know. I'm so glad you came to my end of town today. Thank you. You're welcome. (laughs) So I'll come over here to podcast. You come over to mine for food. I'm on my way right now. <laughs> okay, good. Um, then within that, I mean, there's so many ways of working with a tight budget. Eating seasonally is one of those things. Things are, produce is much less expensive when you buy it in season, when you buy it out of season. There's a reason why avocados are like $8 I in the winter yeah. <laughs> and like 50 cents in the summer. It can make a really, really big difference. And then finding like your staples that are going to be way less expensive. Things like beans, dry beans, rice, any of the grains, lentils, quinoa. quinoa are all really inexpensive and should be the foundation of your diet. I mean, we talk about blue zone diets sometimes and Dan Buettner, who's studying longevity and the people that are living longest in the world, they're all basically eating beans and rice every yeah. day, a form of beans and rice every day. Yeah. I do a lot of quinoa and rice and I do black beans once in a while, but I don't feel like they're a staple. But like the quinoa is really good because it's a base for anything and you just like Mm -hmm. put on your favorite sauce and slap some vegetables Mm -hmm. in a pan and it's like the easiest meal ever and pretty, pretty cheap. It's very easy. It's pretty inexpensive. And actually just yesterday, I, a chef uh, in a competition that I was judging prepared a quinoa tamale. Yum. So instead of using masa, they use quinoa and it was so Good. Is that the one that won? What yeah. Was, that oh, one that won? one won. Okay. Yeah. I saw it. Yeah. Story. It was so creative and mm-hmm. interesting. And I just loved it. I was like, what a unique, interesting way of using quinoa that yeah. I haven't seen before. That I love when good. I see things I've never seen before. I love quinoa because it has that nutty flavor. So was that like, it, was that like part of the taste of it? Mm-hmm. Nice. And they cooked it in like um, ahi amarillo, which is one of the Peruvian peppers, which is just probably my favorite pepper on earth. Oh, okay. I love it. It's so good. Yeah, let's talk about the next level stuff because I'm like, I know that we could talk about like how to make a sandwich for cheap or how to make some quinoa veggies and rice for cheap, but like mm-hmm. how do we make it taste like it was made in Leslie Durso's kitchen? Yeah. Like, you know, spices. Like, okay, spices. Spices. Let's talk spices about Spices might look like they're an investment up front because, you know, it's a little jar of something and it can be five, six dollars up to. You can usually find generic spices for less than that, but they last forever and it's going to give you a big kick. Yeah. Plus, grow them. Spices and herbs are so easy to grow. And so if you even have a windowsill inside, you can grow spices and it obviously will cut your cost level so much if you're growing it yourself, but it adds a tremendous amount of flavor to just about anything that you're doing. And then sauces, learning how to make really good flavorful sauces will change up everything. And sauces are great because even if you're single, like I'm single and I do a lot of recipe development, I'll make a full batch of sauce and then I just freeze it. And so then when I'm starving (laughs) and I just have those veggies or or starch and I just want to saute something, then I have this really dynamic sauce that I can just throw into it. And all of a sudden the meal goes from super bland to really exciting. Yeah. I'm I'm a sauce girl. So when I go to the restaurant, I'm like, I'm sorry, this is not enough sauce. Can I have like two more of these, please? (laughs) So like- But it depends on the restaurant and the sauce. Oh, totally. I mean, (laughs) I'm talking about our vegan restaurants. They still don't give us enough sauce. Like it's always like a little tiny thing in the middle. And you're like, I mean, I could dip one piece of lettuce in there and be done with it. So thank you, but I'm going to need some more. But what are some some of your like go-to recipes for sauces? 
Well, obviously, I mean, I'm Italian, and so all of the Italian mother sauces, I love to always have on hand, tomato, pesto, Alfredo, all freeze really, really well. And then as far as more and more interesting ones, I love the Thai sauces, the Indian Mm -hmm. curries freeze really, really well. I mean, really just anything that you can imagine. How do you make vegan teriyaki sauce? (laughs) I know it's already vegan, but like I was thinking you'd have like I mean, a no you want the salt recipe right there. No no sugar recipe or something. Well, like those a are the two recipe. number one and number ingredients. two ingredients I know, in teriyaki, teriyaki sauce. But it's my favorite. So this is really a question for me. It's not even about how to do a budget. It's just how do I make that? Because I do love teriyaki and I know it's full of sugar and salt. So you could do it with no uh, salt or less salt or do a low sodium yeah. soy sauce. Okay. Um, and you could do it, you could replace this, the sugar with something like maple okay maple sounds delicious yeah because i feel like maple would still give it kind of this earthy nice warm flavor in the teriyaki actually i think you just invented something there i think i'm gonna go home and make a teriyaki with maple yes tag me so i can (laughs) see what you make all right so that's one of my favorite sauces what are some of the other ways that people can like save money by okay we said spices sauces having things on hand what are some other ways that okay food waste Food waste is one of the most expensive things that you can do. I think it's said that people buy, when people buy food, 40% of it is usually thrown out. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. So I know a lot of people work and they only might have one day a week to shop. But if you can break that up and shop multiple times a week, because you're more apt to shop for what you want to have right then and what you're craving now, as opposed to just having food on hand. Um, I know that I always feel that way. When I go shopping, I immediately am buying what I want to eat now. Yeah, yeah. And so if you can do that, that's great. And especially now with deliveries like Prime and stuff like that, it makes it easier to have food come throughout the week. Yeah, and I was talking to someone about Instacart because unlike Postmates, you can actually save money with Instacart because it's like Amazon Prime where you can pay a one-time fee to have no, I guess, delivery fees. And there's like a tiny fee slapped on it, but that's your time back that you don't have to go and spend an hour or two at the grocery store looking for everything, finding everything where you can make a list, send it to someone else to do for you. Groceries are delivered to your door within two hours. And I've done this when I'm traveling and I have a fridge in my hotel room where I'm like, I don't have time to make healthy meals, but I can make something easy in my room. I don't have time to go shop because I have to go now be at this conference. And then I don't have to go out to eat at every single meal when I'm out of town because I can go back to my room and grab something quick and easy. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Instacart, I don't think it's an expensive thing. It can be if you don't have the membership, but I think it's a really good thing just to look into in your city to see if you have it. Maybe Instacart is listening and maybe they want to be your new show sponsor and give away memberships to your listeners. 100% Instacart. If you want to sponsor me, I'm in because I use you all the time. I'm a true fan. And I live two blocks from a grocery store and I still use Instacart. Allison, you need to use your legs. (laughs) Well, no, I actually, I walk there like almost every day to get something easy and quick to eat. Like if I just want a quick meal, because they have a really good salad bar. They have a really good vegan bar. They have a really good little veggie area. They make, they have a pokey area and I don't eat eat the fish, but I eat all the vegetables from the pokey. I mean, they have so many options that are just grab and go, Mm -hmm. which is nice. So I do walk there a lot. Like I mean, there's been so many times where I've walked there and I like have seen people there that I know. I'm just like, oh, you're my neighbor. We're here like all the time. Like it's kind of a joke, like the amount of people I see there all the time. But what I do use Instacart for is the farther away grocery stores that I can't walk to that have different products that I want. Oh, yeah, totally. Okay. Totally. Sorry. Back to food waste. So what were you saying? <laughs> well, so another thing is that you don't necessarily have to throw that food away because people see it every day and they see it going bad and they don't know what to do with it. And there's so many things that are like kind of, I call them kitchen sink recipes that you can basically throw anything into. Obviously, you know, soups, smoothies, broths. I mean, when your food is starting to go, don't don't throw it away immediately. There's definitely things that you can do with it. There's that app. Maybe, does anyone know what it's called? You can type in, here's what I have in my kitchen. It can tell you what you can make a meal out of or like if you need to go get one ingredient to make something with. I don't have that app, but that's a great sounding app. All right, I'm gonna have to find out and get back to you, Food Heals Nation. Yes. (laughs) So can you bust the myth that eating organic, eating 
plant-based is expensive. Eating plant-based is not expensive at all. It can be if you make it expensive. Well, yes, if you're buying processed foods. But if you scale back and you're buying whole real foods, it is far less expensive. Right. Now, if you want to buy processed foods, there's also different places to buy them too. I mean, you're talking about shopping at Whole Foods and in LA, we have Air One. They're kind of like the Mercedes and the Teslas of the grocery (laughs) world. They're definitely the Teslas because they're like cutting edge and trendy. Yeah, but do you know who the number one um, distributor of organic produce is? Okay, I have two guests. Okay. Walmart or Costco? Walmart, Costco's number two. Wow, okay. They have so many vegan options at both of those places and you're gonna get the vegan staples that you love for much cheaper. You might have to buy them in bulk, but again, that's what your freezer is really good for. I highly recommend people buy in bulk and freeze and then you always have something around to eat and it's half the cost. Yeah, what are some of the staples that you usually freeze? Like you were talking about eating seasonally, is there something that you buy in season, in bulk, and then freeze so that you can have it, you know, more year round? Yeah, of course. You can always like make ahead recipes. Like this last weekend I did an event and I had a bunch of this stuffing for taco that I had, and then I had a bunch of leftover masa. So instead of throwing those things out and how many of those things could I possibly eat within the last couple of days? So last night I just sat there um, with my masa and my stuffing and I made a whole bunch of empanadas and I froze them. And so they're all in my freezer. So, you know, and whenever I come home from a long day week and I don't have anything to go, there you go. Take it, throw them in the frying pan and they're done. Okay. So I just made an executive decision that we're going to happy hour at your house instead of... (laughs) Yes. Yes. Okay. Always come to my house. That sounds so good. There's always food and food development <laughs> happening. Um, but things like that, again, um, making a large batch of sauces. If you have a big family, make a double batch and then freeze half of it. I like freezing in smaller portions, you know, just defrost what you need instead of having to defrost an entire batch of something. Veggie burgers is another thing. I love making veggie burgers. So if I feel like one veggie burger, I'll make a whole batch of them, wrap them individually, stick them in a freezer, and then I've got them for the next couple months. But you make them yourself. You're not talking about like getting the frozen Beyond Burger or something. No, I'm talking about making it yourself because again, it's more cost effective. Your money will go further and it's a whole plant-based food. You know what you're putting into it. You can choose how much salt you're putting into it. You can choose to not have any MSG in it. You know, there's a study that I read recently that consuming large amounts of salt is just as deadly as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Right. And I think they said the same thing about sugar Mm -hmm. in one of these documentaries. Maybe what the health. Now, time out because not all sugar is created equal. We're not talking about stopping eating apples and bananas and fruit and strawberries. We're talking about processed Processed sugar. sugar. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. (laughs) So sugar gets a bad name. I know. Okay. So where can we find your recipes? Because I'm like, I know you have a cookbook that's going to come out. It's not ready yet, but where can people go and get some recipes right now? Because I know my mouth is watering just from Aww. talking to you. Well, I have some recipes on my website, which is just lesslederso.com. But then I also am doing a lot of recipes on my Instagram and in my mailing list. I try and send out a once a month newsletter with recipes that are kind of secret just for the people that are subscribing. Leslie's catered a couple of my events, but also I've been to her events and everything is divine. Even we have a monthly meetup and you guys are all welcome if you're in LA, vegan lady boss, but where she makes, everyone brings something, but whatever Leslie has made, you are dying. It is so delicious. And she makes it look so easy. You're so sweet. Well, cooking should be easy. It should be. It should be very low stress and fun. It should be fun. And if more people treated it as fun and something light and not put all this pressure on having to do some epic, unbelievable dinner for somebody, it would be a lot more fun for some people. I do think it's fun, but I I don't think it's as fun as you think it is fun. (laughs) So I need to learn. I do. There's the five languages of love. I feel like yeah. my language of love is the sixth. It's the feeding people Aww. language of love. I, I get so much joy out of feeding people. Maybe that's like the gift giving one because you're giving them the gift of food, not only just food, but food that nourishes them. You know, like we always grow up like with food is love, but unhealthy food, that's not something that we want to be putting in our bodies. And you're here. I want to nourish people with healthy food that actually tastes amazing and show people how plant-based meals can taste so good and get rid of that stigma that like vegans eat fucking lettuce, you know? Oh yeah, I know. And every time I'll meet meat eaters and they'll be like, no, never trust a skinny chef. And I'm like, 
Never trust a fat chef. I could not agree more. That's funny that they say that to you. Yeah. I mean, the way that I look is a direct result of what I put in my body yeah. and the kind of food that I feed other people. Yeah. And that's And kind I of... eat with her all the time. She eats people. So uh, it's not I, one of those fake... I eat a lot. But <laughs> fake, I like, eat... oh, I'm actually anorexic here. No, but I eat whole real food. Yeah. And that's it is when you eat whole real food, you can eat a lot more of it. Yeah. And you don't eat a lot of the processed meat and things like that. I no. eat some, but very little. Um, I enjoy it when I'm out and I'm like, oh my God, the only option in Indiana is the Beyond Burger or whatever, or the Impossible Burger. And I'm like, yay. But when I'm home and I have control over my meals, like I don't eat that stuff. Well, I'll also say it's never the only option. Even in those states that you just listed, there's always more options. I've been to 49 of our 50 states yeah, and I have never been super desperate to find food. Well, usually I'm like, okay, we'll take the rice from this dish, the tomato and avocado from this mm-hmm. dish, the, you know, and I just put, I, I have them put something together and you know, who does it the best, honestly, is Italian restaurants because yeah. they take so much pride in their pastas and their sauces and their olive oils and their red sauce. So if you're like, I don't eat meat or cheese, I really want to taste like your pasta with red sauce with vegetables. They will take so much care to make you something so delicious. Yeah. So, it'll be out of this world. Yeah. Well, Italy is so easy to eat. I mean, we went to Italy together. There's so many foods that are accidentally vegan. Yeah. It's so easy to eat there. So delicious. I can't even eat here now that I've been exposed. Like olives are not the same. Wine is not the same. I mean, we're so spoiled now. We are. Nothing is the same. They really do. But you know, Italy grows, all those restaurants grow most of their own food. Right. And it's local. It's, it's organic. Mm-hmm. It's grown it's, in the region. They take so much pride in it. Yup. You're taking all the words right out of my mouth. Sorry. Go ahead, Leslie. Oh, no, you I, did it. You said it. I hung out with you too much. Now I know I know your spiel. So it's, <laughs> I've adopted it as my own. That's what happens when you hang out with people too much. <laughs> it's totally fine. We should just continue to hang out with even more. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for being here. Remind everyone one more time where they can find you online. Sure. All my social media is just Leslie Durso, L-E-S-L-I-E-D-U-R-S-O, and it's lesliedurso.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, women have experienced a strong desire to stop asking their boyfriends if they look fat in this dress. If you experience any of these symptoms, post a selfie to Instagram immediately.